Everyone, what's up? Goldie here, and I'm going to be going over the 11 game main slate that we've got here on Friday night. Um, might be able to might be able to actually cross off a couple of these games. Got some weather concerns in Washington here, and this is one of these one of these teams we hate messing with uh, when there's rain in the area. Um, they often do do you pull all kinds of shenanigans, and we also have some concerns in the Atlanta and the Mets game. A um, lot of ownership coming to these two guys on the mound initially, and weather really not looking good. Uh, this is a division game, so they'd be much more apt to uh, postpone this game and then run a doubleheader. They'll have opportunities later on in the season. Um, since they're they are playing another whatever it is 13 games in the division against every team, so um, this is probably the game I'd be most concerned about. But Pittsburgh and Washington, it's just Friday here, and if they don't have any rain in the forecast for Saturday or Sunday, they can run double headers on those days um, as well. So. Just a couple things to keep in mind. We probably aren't going to spend too much time on those on those couple of games, but uh, notable um, that we are seeing ownership on Max Fried, full 20% now on him, and David Peterson, about 12% on the other side. Nice projections for them coming in, so it would be you know good pitching weather. Bad, bad fundamental matchups, though. Freed against the Mets here, a really rough spot, even though we really like playing Max Fried. Good price tag for him. Um, bad, really bad, bad at ball matchup for, for Freed here. And same thing with Dave Peterson on the other side. He's been terrible and he gets Atlanta now. Um, K stuff is K stuff, but if you, you give up nine runs to start, uh, that, that ain't going to do it. So we might be able to just cross off these couple of games. Unfortunate because we'd kind of like to play Pittsburgh tonight against Chad cool. Uh, and maybe even a couple of Washington pieces against Rich Hill. So, um, but the kind of elephant in the room is Jacob DeGrom. We have him on the mound today, 11-5, seeing 50% ownership so far. And initially <clears throat> on such a large slate with a lot of arms here, I, I kind of balked at that number. I was like, whoa, this has to be way too high. But I was going through the slate and it maybe, maybe it isn't because we're not all that thrilled about getting to some guys at some elevated price tags in some pretty bad matchups. And, of course, we talked about the weather in that those other couple of games. Um, it, it's kind of gross on the mound. So it may actually be pretty understandable that DeGrom comes in here at full 50%. He gets Yankees tonight, and they may be missing Aaron Judge. So um, that said, let's, uh, let's just get into it. We do have projections loaded to the site already, so keep an eye out for those. And certainly things are going to change uh, ownership wise if any of these games are canceled so um, let's just get into it Pittsburgh and Washington we'll go over it briefly um, I'm not interested in playing Rich Hill even though he took apart the Rockies in a really bad spot earlier in the season 5800 I'm uh, like this is a pretty weak lineup but <laughs> against lefties so far look at this strikeout rate 50 sub 15 percent for the Nats um they put up some production again last night against a left-handed starter in Joey Lucchese. So um, this has been a, a really sticky team to go after against lefties. No power, really, to speak of. But, um, you know, they'll get guys like Joey Manessis going again, and he'll increase those numbers a little bit for them. But I don't want to go after him with a pretty low strikeout pitcher himself uh, and a guy that's not going to go all that deep into a game here with Rich Hill, even at 5,800. Probably a couple of cheaper guys you may, might want to prefer to play instead. Uh, would love to get to the Pirates tonight if they run this game, but it doesn't look like they're going to. Um, supposed to rain pretty much all night in the D.C. and Baltimore area, so that's uh, that's not great. Um, Chad Cool on the other side. There's no chance we'd be playing him anyway in a full slate, uh, certainly against Pittsburgh. So um, would really only prefer offense in this game but uh, unlikely that we're going to be able to get to it. Okay, let's move on to Seattle and Toronto. Good pitching matchup here. Probably 
un- I mean, I don't know. I, I'm not super jacked about playing 20% Alec Manoa, even at 6,900 against Seattle. It's okay. We'll get to that in a sec. But at 10-3 for Luis Castillo, I'm not super jacked about play- paying this price either. Um, I generally don't like paying above 10000 When we get into the $9,900 range or so and above for Luis Castillo, uh, for whatever reason, they're just like the price tag it sort of implicitly spikes his variance, right? Um, you know, it's kind of a, a weird way to think about it, but I I don't like paying an expensive price tag above 10K for Castillo. There's still some variance with him, and occasionally he can um, he can start floating the two seamer here, and it gets him hit around a little bit. Uh, changeup is still not a very good pitch value-wise relative to the rest of the league, even though he does have the good three-pitch mix. Otherwise, he's throwing this, this change here a lot, and pretty big negative value against the left side of the plate. Now, Toronto, they don't have all that many lefties. They do have some, right? And they're still going to strike out, namely Kevin Biggio, uh, Kiermaier, not great against lefties, of course. Um, Brandon Belt, it, it, he is hopefully 1500 today on DK. I don't, I don't think they're they're pulling those cards just yet, but uh, no, he's 22, so still above the Stoneman. But he is from the left side, and of course they have Dalton Varsho. He'll strike out a little bit. Good price tag though at 4300 for him, and can get to baseball in the air. So th- that's how we'd like to go after Luis Castillo if we're gonna do it. Uh, the righties on the other side, they're not gonna strike out a whole hell of a lot even though Castillo bringing in a 30% K rate to the right side of the plate. In aggregate, in 700 PAs against righties this season, 260 average nearly, which is a pretty damn good number, 22% K rate, pretty respectable number as well, 9.5% walk rate, elevating a little bit and getting on base here, hitting for some power at 170. 117 WRC+, plus. so these guys are creating still, hitting the ball hard, not... A lot of soft contact here, sub-16% aggregate soft contact rate against the right side. So despite the fact they don't have a lot of lefties, these righties are still hitting the baseball really hard over here as well. So not overly thrilled about paying a full 10-3 for Castillo. Uh, That said, he is projecting okay and not quite as high for somebody that we are going to be paying over 10K for. Um, And commensurately coming in at, at pretty low ownership, Sub-8% right now. This will adjust throughout the day, of course, but um, I think this is going to make him a pretty decent tournament play. He obviously has elite numbers against the right side. 206 average, 247 Woba with an 093 ISO, and the aforementioned 30% strikeout rate. A lot of soft contact induced here, 18%, and a sub-28% hard contact rate. These are excellent numbers. High ground ball to fly ball, 175 to 1. No production, really, to the right side. He doesn't walk people, and he stays off the barrel. That's really all we can hope for when we're paying this much for a guy. Um, But the lack of a very good changeup to really neutralize these other lefties is worrisome. And the value on the two-seamer, he can float it. He comes in a little bit three-quarters and kind of submarines it a little bit sometimes. Um, with the release point, and if he's not really burying this sinker down in the strike zone, inducing ground balls, then this becomes a real bad pitch real quick to the left side of the plate. Um, Lefties hit for high average against right-handed sinkers. So with the lack of a change and the potential for some variance in a two-seamer with Luis Castillo, At an elevated price tag, I'm not super thrilled about going after Toronto. I generally don't like going after them anyway, uh, unless it's with very, very high strikeout arms. Now, Luis Castillo is one of them, for sure. But 10-3 is is a stiff price tag, and you've got Framber, and we've got DeGrom, of course, in that same range, who we might be able to get to. Um, DeGrom's certainly in a, a much better matchup, and he's DeGrom. 8% 8% though is very attractive, and I think this makes for an interesting tournament play if you want to get to him. He still has six innings and eight, nine Ks in him, even against a, a lower strikeout team in Toronto. So um, really not crazy about playing Toronto. They're still kind of expensive at their normal price tags. 5K for Springer, that's fine. 
in general for him. 59 for Bo Bichette, no thank you. Vladdy at 6,000 flat. I, I love Vladdy, but uh, probably not the matchup we want to be paying 6K for a first baseman for. 55 for Matt Chapman as well. So the one piece price adjusted that I kind of like here is a Dalton Varsho, 4,300. I think that's all right. Um, if you do want to get down to a Brandon Belt, uh, okay, but uh, not wild about um, playing Brandon Belt on a full 11-game slate here in a pretty difficult matchup for him. I mean, still a 25% K rate to the left side, even though there's a 36% hard contact, just 11% soft contact to lefties for Castillo. More fly balls there. Uh, so a little bit more worrisome with the lack of a changeup, but the slider-sinker four-seamer combo, when it's rolling, it can blast through both sides. Really no worries there. So it makes him a decent tournament target for us. Uh, Alec Manoa on the other side, 6,900 for him, projecting nearly the exact same as Castillo, and he's, what, 3,400 cheaper? So, I mean, if we're if those are the only metrics we're looking at, uh, Manoa is definitely the uh, preferred play. And sure, we're seeing about 2.5x the ownership on him. It's a, a better raw strikeout matchup for Manoa. However, Manoa, not really a strikeout pitcher himself, and really hasn't been good to start the season. Had a very good start in his last outing against the Yankees. That was encouraging to see. Still at roughly the same price tag. He was 68 in his, in his last start. Went 7, struck out 5, though, uh, against a Yankees team that is striking out a boatload here in the early going, a full 25%. Now, the um, the Mariners are also striking out a good bit so far, 24 25%. Average walk rate, average ISO, average WOBA, average hard contact rate, average ground ball to fly ball. So, and sure enough, all those numbers aggregating to a dead even 100 WRC+. plus. So they have not been overly impressive so far and actually split adjusted, striking out at one of the higher clips on the slate. And it would make them, oh, let's see, eh, about fifth or sixth split adjusted. So I think it's an attackable spot for Manoa. There is some strikeout upside because Seattle's been pretty bad. But generally for Manoa, he's not a strikeout pitcher, and that's not why we play him. We play him in good matchups to run deep into games because he's a horse. He'll go out there and he'll throw a lot, similar to a Lance Lynn. He just chucks. And there's a little bit of variance when he pitches to a bit more contact, certainly to the left side. That's how we would want to go after him in terms of raw contact. It's not necessarily in power allowed or anything like that, but just a, a 19% K rate with very righty heavy lineups. That's where we like to target Manoa and, and play him 26 and percent K rate to the right side. Hard contact rate, sub 20%. He's, he's elite in suppression against the right side, really good four-seamer sinker slider mix, and a changeup that he'll mix in and throw to some righties sometimes as well. Good change here, though, neutralizes a lot of the power that the sub-19% K rate would otherwise suggest against the left side. So uh, he's a fine arm. He's a, he's a good pitcher. And at 6,900, it's an attractive price tag. We're kind of, if certainly if we if we lose the Atlanta Mets game, you're probably going to see this ownership number spike, which would almost certainly take me off. But this lineup over here for Seattle is actually trying to get a little bit more balanced. They've moved Kelnick up to the three now. He's at a playable price at 4,100 for sure. Um, and Julio up top, you could always play. But Ty France, Price finally starting to come down, 4,500. Gino, who, he's just been awful. Didn't strike out a whole hell of a lot against lefties, but, man, big strikeout numbers against the right side. Tay Oscar down at 4,300 now. So these are playable price tags over here for Seattle. And, of course, Julio at 57. It's not great, but you can you could play 57 Julio. It's, it's Julio. Cal Raleigh hitting from the left side. That's his better side for sure. 4,000, kind of stiff for a catcher on a full 11 gamer. But... Um, some cheap pieces down at the bottom of the lineup, Colton Wong, JP Crawford, they can platoon with as well. So I think I would, now that the, now that the Mariners are trying to, um, uh, break up the right-handed monotony, as it were at the top of the lineup, I think I would probably side with them. And we're seeing some elevated run totals north of four and a half for both of these teams over here. So, um, at increased ownership here for Alec Manoa, I'm not wild about getting a full 20% of him, 
even at an attractive price tag, it, it it's okay, but I think I would probably end up coming in underweight to this. Uh, it's probably a bit too high, and certainly if it steams to 25 and 30% if we lose the Atlanta game, it's where most of the ownership is going to go, is to Manoa. So um, I would definitely come in underweight at, at that number and almost try and get to some Seattle pieces on the other side. I think it's a sneaky offensive spot for the Mariners because Manoa still does pitch to a lot of contact, and in the early going, despite one good start, uh, Manoa's not been great. He has, as we talked about, he was good against the Yankees, 5Ks in seven innings. But against Detroit, he was bad. He got picked apart pretty good, only went four and a third, struck out three there. And against Tampa, he got really beat up. Four and two thirds, gave up seven, just struck out five. Did go seven innings against Kansas City in his first start, struck out five, though, again. So the, the raw K stuff is yet to show up for Manoa, and that's really not who he is. He's more of a pitcher. Um, who can run deep into games. And this could be a little bit of a difficult spot. At elevated ownership, I'm not sure I'm super excited about that. So we can get through this one pretty quickly. Freed, I like the price tag. I do not like the ownership in this particular matchup at pushing 20%. Uh, I love the Arsenal. I love playing Max Freed. I love playing him at good prices, but it, in tournaments. I mean, it, nobody plays him, but at elevated ownership, uh, in a really, really bad, batted ball matchup for him, um, I'm not, I'm not super interested. Now I know the last few days Mets got taken apart a little bit by uh, JoJo Gray and Mackenzie Gore. Max Freed better arm than both of those guys for sure. But I, still, I, let's not get carried away and just, just because the Mets had a bad series against Washington pitching doesn't really mean that we want to start going after these guys. Still just 21% K rate, 10% walk rate, 160 ISO, hitting for a little bit more power against lefties so far this year than they did last year. Neutral WRC plus here so far at just a couple ticks above average. Um, a lot of medium contact here so far, so that's encouraging for opposing starters. But you know, if you want to take deep tournament shots... On, on Max Freed, I think that's fine. The price tag here warrants that. But once again, we got to be aware of the weather. This probably, this game's probably not going to play. So David Peterson on the other side, 7,200. There's no chance I go near this. Uh, he gives up way too much power to the left side, like an outrageous amount. 39% hard contact with 2.5 homers per 9 with a 263 ISO to lefties. That's a bad fastball. It's a bad two-seamer. It's bad slider. It's bad curveball. He just doesn't have the arsenal to even pick through same-handed hitters. Now, he neutralizes with a decent change-up some of the right-handed power he would give up otherwise, and that does give him a little bit of swing and miss. But um, he has trouble throwing strikes because he can't spot any of this stuff. 54% strike one rate is awful. 10% walk rate, and I don't care about a high strikeout rate. Even against the Braves, the underlying arsenal here is not attractive at all, and we've seen in pretty much... Every start for him this season get taken apart uh, by lefties, definitely. Um, he gave up a couple of bombs to, I think, Freddie Freeman and Max Muncy in his start against the Dodgers. He gave up seven earned runs against the Giants in his last start. The strikeout stuff, yeah, it's it's there. So if he can somehow piece together some command with the fastball and, and start really spinning the slider, yeah, he could piece, pick through a lineup. But... I mean, this is, this is the Braves, and we don't generally want to be targeting them with left-handers anyway. Um, and it, it, so this is a really, really high-variant spot for David Peterson, and a full 12% ownership as, as of right now, it, no thank you. Uh, certainly concerning the weather, or with the weather, I'm, I'm totally off of that game at the moment. Uh, would prefer getting to the Braves if we could get there. They're expensive, but... Uh, probably not going to play, no matter what. So Tampa and the White Sox, Zach Eflin on the mound, 9000 Pretty elevated price tag for him. Uh, not overly thrilled. But I think in this range, he could be one of the tournament pieces we could consider today. Um, 9000 I really don't like this price tag. He's been pretty good, though, in his three starts this season. Good matchups, of course, Detroit, Oakland, and these same White Sox just five days ago in his last start. Elevated on the price now, however, 7,500, 7,600 in his last start. 
against the White Sox, and that made him a playable tournament piece. He's still very playable at 9K and sub-3% ownership, but the raw strikeout matchup, even though the White Sox uh, are typically known for not striking out uh, a whole hell of a lot, it's going to leave a little bit on the table for Eflin in particular because he doesn't have overwhelming whiff stuff himself, even though the, the White Sox this season missing Tim Anderson up at the top, Yoel Moncada. They, they're they striking out a little bit more, 23.5% compared to last year when they were at about 19 or 20%. So 83 WRC plus here so far. They've been really missing Tim Anderson at the top. I believe he's on a rehab assignment currently, so should see him back next week. And they're really going to need some sort of spark because this lineup has been bad top to bottom. No power, not getting on base, not walking, impatient here. Uh, so very attackable, I think, with Zach Eflin at an even elevated price tag. Don't get me wrong. But super low ownership, that's going to keep the numbers down here. I think it's an okay tournament piece because nobody's going to play the guy. He's going to throw strikes for you, and we're we're really worried that if he ends up giving up any production, three runs or something, two runs, something like that, might have a little bit of trouble recovering that with the lack of raw whiff stuff. But overall, at super low ownership, I think this is a, an okay tournament play. Uh, he's not going to project because this price tag is going to keep him down. Uh, and, and the matchup is generally not great. But this is a pretty weak White Sox lineup. They're, they're struggling quite a bit. I think this is an okay tournament piece in Chicago. And this ballpark here will play down power, play up pitching a little bit more. Uh, certainly when it's 55 degrees at night. So I think this is an okay play. On the other side for Lucas Giolito on the mound, he was good two starts ago. Not so good in his last start. Um, and the first few starts for Giolito earlier in the season were also really not very good. But he's been trying to figure it out a little bit. He's not been nearly as bad as somebody like uh, Michael Kopech or Dylan Cease. Uh, or even Lance Lynn. Those guys are just getting picked apart. So something in the water, I guess, in Chicago over here for the White Sox and clubhouse. It, I mean, their pitching staff has just been terrible. So overall, Giolito, I, I like playing him at, at reduced price tags. 7500 is certainly that. Uh, but he's still having problems giving up barrel contact. Now, the strikeout stuff has been a little bit more encouraging this season. Um, in his last three starts, went six innings against Minnesota, six against Philly, struck out seven in each of those starts. He had a no-hitter going against Philly. Um, it was just the pitch count that elevated him. He was fantastic in that start, and he was serviceable, popped for 20 DK points in that start against Minnesota, but is seeing Tampa in back-to-back -back starts here, and they got him for four runs in the last outing. He struck out five, and he went a full seven innings. So that's nice to see. But the Arsenal's still leaving quite a bit on the table here for Lucas Giolito overall. And it doesn't seem early here in the, in the first part of the season, the first several starts, that he has really fixed the, the barrel problems to the right side of the plate where he's giving up a lot of power and a lot of hard contact, a lot of average. 304 still in aggregate over his last 189 and two-thirds, I guess 104 and a third against the right side of the plate. So um, still pretty susceptible, and I don't like going after Tampa. This is an incredible baseball team. They put up another 15 spot yesterday. Uh, they just do it every damn night, and G. Lito's still going to pitch to a bit too much hard contact. I think I need to see a little bit more from him before I, I start to get jacked. But admittedly, this is an attractive price tag. At 10% ownership, I think this is an okay play. You might see some of the ownership from uh, a potential cancellation of the Atlanta and Philly game go to Giolito as well. If this starts to spike to 16 18 percent or so, I definitely come in under and would like to get to some Tampa stacks on the other side. Uh, I'm not thrilled about playing pitchers against Tampa at the moment. They're they're just too difficult to get through. And every one of them seeing the baseball really completely irrespective of platoon 
and um, bad matchups or anything like that. They've been they've been really really strong and difficult to attack. So I think I'd prefer Tampa and Eflin on the mound in tournaments. I don't like the price for him. Um, no White Sox for me. I don't necessarily want to go after Eflin and the White like the whole lineup has just been awful. So despite real attractive price tags for sure, um, if we were gonna go after him, it would be with some lefties like a. I mean, they don't even have any good lefties anymore. Like, Ben Benintendi is going to make some contact, but not a lot of raw power. 3600 is a nice price tag, though. Uh, and Yasmani Grandal, 3300 would be a fine catcher piece in the five hole, but, um, you know, certainly not favorite plays here to be going after Eflin. Eflin would much prefer just getting to Tampa. Here on the mound in Cleveland, or in Boston for Cleveland, I think we could maybe get to some Bieber tournament pieces as well. 9,300 is fine and uh, a decent projection middling uh, so far, about 15 points. I think that's okay. Not a great batted ball matchup. Boston's been pretty damn good against righty so far this year. Sub 20% strikeout rate, 8.5% walk rate. It's about average. Hitting for some power, though. 190 ISO and a 333 WOBA, 107 WRC+, creating a little bit. And the lineup has been a lot better than you would really have thought coming into the season still missing guys like Trevor Story and, and things like that. Some of these lefties here, the addition of Masataki Yoshida has, has really helped them. Um, and Justin Turner in the middle of the lineup really helping drop this strikeout rate pretty significantly as well. Uh, they do have some young hitters. Of course, Alex Verdugo, Rafi Devers, they don't strike out. Uh, but they're younger hitters like Tristan Casas, Jaron Duran, Reese McGuire, they did just call up Emmanuel Valdez as well. Hits from the left side. Probably all going to be in the lineup tonight and will whiff a little bit. And really, the raw strikeout stuff for Shane Bieber is much better to the left side of the plate. His suppression numbers, despite some elevated hard contact, pushing 36% to lefties, suppression numbers are really good. 1.6 ground ball to fly ball, 219 average, 258 Woba with a buck 15 ISO, 27% K rate. And that's really because he's got a, a decent cutter that he'll run in on the hands to them, but it's mostly the slider curveball mix that's really good value for him. What he does with this slider is he starts at middle middle and then it breaks not terribly downward, but uh, it, it cuts really hard and it cuts hard late. So he keeps it middle middle very late. Same release point as the four seamer and the cutter. So it's difficult to pick up for a left-hander, and that's why we see so much swing and miss on the pitch. Curveball's really, really good, too, and he uses this against the right side to neutralize some of the bad value that, or neutral value, I should say, that he sees on the four-seamer. So um, really wish he'd throw the cutter a bit more and come off of this four-seamer a little bit, but this is still fine. At a third of the arsenal with uh, a four-seam fastball, it's not... Like, that's a bad strategy, necessarily. So, um, if, since Boskin is likely to platoon pretty heavily against him tonight, I think this is a fine tournament piece to go after some Bieber at low ownership. He has upside to pick through this lineup. Now, the aggregate numbers, as we went over, they're, they're going to tell you to uh, avoid Bieber in a lot of scenarios here. But they're going to have probably seven lefties in the lineup tonight against him. And, uh, yeah... Verdugo and Endeavor is not going to strike out a lot, but they're still attackable. And Bieber, like he's very good against the left side. So I, I think this is an okay matchup for him, and it's super low ownership. I, th I think it makes him an attractive tournament piece uh, against Boston. Really would prefer not getting there. I mean, it's 55 degrees in Boston. Not going to be super crazy about offense. However, I'm going, to, I'm going to walk that back right now when I said kind of like the Guardians a little bit against Nick Pavetta. He gives up way too much power. I don't really care who it is uh, on the other side or if it's 30 degrees. I'm still going to target him because he gives up 38% hard contact still over his last 121 and two-thirds to the right side of the plate. That's way too high, and it's one of the higher numbers for a starting pitcher in baseball. It's really due to neutral value. I mean, it's a fine slider, but not a lot of swing and miss on it. He floats a little bit, and he's only got the four-seamer, which is kind of a straight pitch, and he throws it a full 50% of the time. Now, that's okay at 33%, right, When with Shane Bieber at 
a third of the arsenal. But when you get to neutral value on your four seamer and you're throwing it half of the time, that makes you much more hittable. And that's what's leading to a lot of the hard contact. Uh, it does still have the swing and miss, and that's with the slider to the right side. But no changeup really to speak of at all, and that's what gives him power issues to the left side. 213 ISO with a 23% K rate there, 11, 12% walk rate even. North of 30% hard contact as well, two lefties, and a 1.7 homers per nine. So it makes him very susceptible to both sides of the plate, and I don't like playing the guy. I don't think the arsenal is very good, and I don't think the upside is really there in super subpar matchups. And the Guardians over here on the other side, in terms of raw strikeout stuff and batted ball profile, are a super subpar matchup for sure. 85 WRC plus for them is probably going to be where they are most of the season. Very low upside, so hard to play them in tournaments. But they walk a ton, and... They're actually stealing a lot, right up there with Arizona as the two most active teams in baseball, I guess with Pittsburgh as well, at in base stealing. And they recognize that they're not a very high upside, power-ridden lineup, that when they, when they get their guys on base, like a Stephen Kwan and Med Rosario up at the top of the lineup, they're going to be moving. And I think Nick Pavetta is a fine target to attack here. Um certainly with guys that aren't going to strike out sub 19% aggregate K rate for them as well. So we could in, in some scenarios, see a, a good bit of contact on the bat tonight in Boston. But I think I would rather get to Bieber. He's certainly a better arm than Pavetta. I don't think that's really close or debatable. Uh, and I think I'd rather get to the guardians here against Pavetta himself on the mound. Uh, he gives up too much power and too much contact for my liking it is 55 degrees, though, in Boston at night, and that really, it, it tends to play down power quite a lot, even though it is a hitter's park. Uh, you kind of need the weather to cooperate up there in Boston. So um, I think I would side with Bieber here in most scenarios. Give me Bieber and the Guardians, and then probably the Red Sox and Pavetta last on the list. Uh, in terms of playable spots in this game. Really not excited about going after Boston here tonight. And I think a dollar thirty that you got to lay on the Guardians is a playable price in the betting markets tonight. I don't think that's uh, a bad punt at all. Okay, let's get to Yankees in Texas. Clark Schmidt on the mound, 6,200. Still not playing him. Still only going about four innings. Um, and has major, major problems to the left side of the plate. 306 average, huge number. 395 Woba, huge number. 248 ISO, huge number. 35% hard contact, 2.1 homers per nine to lefties, and this hasn't really changed, even though he's kind of been in the rotation to start the season here. He's still getting picked apart by left-handers. Now, his last outing against a shockingly very right-handed heavy lineup, he went five and two-thirds, struck out eight against Toronto. Texas is going to be able to platoon here, and even though the the lefties for them are not overly high upside, they still have guys that make a lot of contact. We'll see if Travis Jankowski is going to be back in the list tonight, uh, dealing with a bit of a hip issue, I believe. But they had um, Robbie Grossman in there, who hits from both sides, kind of a pest at the top of the lineup. Probably better from the left side. In terms of raw contact is Grossman, so he's a fine little plug-and-play two-hole hitter that they can use if Jankowski is out. Um, Nate Lowe in the three-hole, 4600 This is a playable price for him, and you can get to some lefty pieces because you've got some cheap guys down like a, a Zeke Duran, multi-position eligibility, outfield and shortstop at 26 You could play Josh Smith. I wouldn't really recommend it necessarily, but he's playable in stacks. Leody Tavares hits from both sides as well. Super cheap down at the bottom of the lineup. So, of course, they have Jonah Heim in the middle hitting from both sides. 42, not super thrilled about that price. But this is a high upside spot for these lefties over here. And, of course, you've got Adelise Garcia and Marcus Semien who have been great really all season. So, uh, no Clark Schmidt for me on the mound. Way too much contact to the left side of the plate and way too much hard contact to the right. He still gives it up there. 34% is a big number despite good strikeout stuff to the righties. Uh, I'm not super interested in going after Marcus Semien. He's a very good fastball hitter, and Clark Schmidt's got a bad fastball here. So um, he'd have to get really, really heavy on the slider, and which he he does. He throws it the most out of any of his pitches. I guess that in, in tandem with the curveball. 
Um, he's throwing those nearly, I guess, over 50% of the time here, 55 actually. Um, so he's heavy on the breaking stuff, which could neutralize a Semyon and an Adelis Garcia, but probably going to have problems with the left side again due to lack of a changeup and a really bad fastball mix. So no Clarky for me. And we're definitely going to want to play DeGrom, of course. He gets the Yankees, who've been striking out a crap load, 25% in aggregate so far this year against right-handers. And, yeah, there's some power there, but most of it's coming from Judge, who is likely to be out of the lineup tonight. He got yanked in the fourth inning, I believe, last night due to some hip discomfort or something. Um, So they may just give him a day off and... I mean, maybe that's that's good for power suppression, of course, for DeGrom, um, because it's Judge, right? And he can hit anybody. DeGrom's susceptibility, if he has one, would be power to the right side. Does give up a 180 ISO there, despite a 42.5% strikeout rate. Um, and he's on the barrel a little bit at pushing 10%, 33% hard contact to righties. So when he gets picked apart, it's usually by a right-hander. We saw it a couple of starts ago. Uh, for DeGrom, maybe it was his last start, Shea Langoliers hit a bomb shot off of him. So even traditionally uh, below average hitters can get to the best arm in baseball here in DeGrom. But if Judge is out of lineup, like, sign me up. Give me everybody, um, or nobody against him, rather, and give me all of the DeGrom at uh, at 11.5. So as I mentioned in the opening, I kind of balked at initial 50% ownership, but we're not too thrilled about some of these arms here. We might lose some chalk pieces down in the mid-range, which is probably going to filter a lot of this ownership up to DeGrom, and he still has a 42.5% strikeout rate to both sides of the plate. And this is over 91 innings so far. Like, this is not a short, noisy sample. The only issue that we've run into so far this year with DeGrom is just pitch count, right? He came out of a game against Kansas City, I think, after four innings. Only went six, just threw like 85 pitches or something uh, against Oakland, but still struck out 11 in six innings, you know? like So we're not worried about DeGrom or anything. It's, it's just pitch count, and Bochy really letting him, letting him go. Uh, if he's totally rolling here, he could strike out 13 or 14 against the Yankees. They have been that poor. And they're missing their best power hitter. Uh, we'll see if he's back in the lineup tonight. But probably mostly precautionary to, to keep Judge out. Um, but we'll see. If he if he's done, I mean, you're probably going to have a pretty difficult time not getting near 100% with this type of projection for DeGrom tonight. I mean, the strikeout rate is just out, out of control high. Uh, so no Yankees, of course. And give me some Texas against Clark Schmidt. I like the lefties there a good bit. You can mix in some expensive, but... Uh, viable pieces with Marcus Semien and Adelis Garcia. Okay, Angels and the Brewers, Tyler Anderson, who has been awful, and Wade Miley, who really just doesn't have a lot of upside. Um, attractive price tag for Tyler Anderson. We're not paying 9K for him or anything anymore like we had to sometimes last year with the Dodgers. Uh, but, man, he has been bad. In his last, what, three start, he was fine in his first start, but that was against Oakland, right? He went six innings, struck out four. K stuff has always been a concern and upside has been a concern for playing Tyler Anderson in tournaments. Of course, he threw most of his career at Coors Field. But even outside of Coors Field, you want him in in really good strikeout matchups and teams that aren't going to make a hell of a lot of content uh, contact rather. Um, now, the Brewers early <laughs> here in the early part of the season, I mean, they have been dreadful. This is a super noisy number at 33 percent K rate. 185 PA so far, I mean, this is not going to persist. To give you some context, the strike split-adjusted strikeout rate for teams against their um, opposing pitcher handedness on the slate today, the Brewers at 32.8% are a full 7% higher than the next highest team, which is Kansas, uh, excuse me, which is Cincinnati at 25.8%. So, like, that's a huge, huge number, and it's very noisy, and that kind of illustrates why we have to be careful with small samples. This is going to regress, and it could very well come tonight against a a, a left-handed arm that doesn't have any K-stuff himself. Really about 18.5% to 19% to both sides of the plate here. Now, he induces a lot of soft contact, which could prevent the Brewers from getting there, and really what only helps him survive is soft contact, and when he induces a lot of it, he can 
run deep into a game. But if he ever gives up any production in terms of runs, it's super difficult for him to make that back. Because of the lack of raw strikeout upside. Very good changeup, which neutralizes power, but doesn't have a breaking pitch. So he's a four-seamer cutter change guy that is kind of predictable in the arsenal. So um, a little bit more susceptible to some power and, and average are the righties. And like I said, he's been dreadful in his last three starts. Toronto gave up five. Uh, at Boston gave up six. And Kansas City at home also gave up five. So the strikeout stuff, not there. And if he's giving up, as I mentioned, any runs whatsoever, uh, it makes him super difficult to play. Now, an attractive price tag in what, at least to this point, against Brewers has been uh, a lock and load matchup. Um, I, I don't know. I think we're about to see some, well, we're going to see some regression in one way or the other, either for Tyler Anderson in in being able to suppress against a weak Brewers lineup so far against lefties, or for the Brewers regressing super hard from this th- these batted ball numbers here against a very attackable and hittable arm. Pitching to 88 or 78% contact is Tyler Anderson. Now, he's going to throw strikes. Throw strike one, gets ahead of hitters, and that's what allows him to run deeper into games when he's suppressing. Uh, so if the Brewers just don't have it tonight, that, I mean... He, it, he could be a viable tournament piece at 6,500, and you could see him pop for 20 or so. Um, but in outsized exposures, this is pushing 7.5 and 10%. I'm not super thrilled about that. I would rather come in under and probably just exit, but I'm not, I'm not sure uh, if I'd totally X him. I'd side with the Brewers in most scenarios, definitely. I like going after Tyler Anderson just because of the contact rate in general. Um but admittedly, the, the Brewers have been really frustrating against lefties so far this year. Wade Miley on the mound for them, 8,700. I, I think the price is just too high. Like I like playing him at 6,700 6, when he's unowned. But at 8,700, I just don't think the upside is there for him. Um, even against the Angels, who are a pretty weak lineup themselves, not so much against lefties this season. 255 PAs, sub-20% K rate there. 183 ISO, so 130 WRC plus. They've been creating quite a bit and been very sticky against lefties. I'm not wild about playing Wade Miley. Definitely not at 8,700 here. Uh, I would much rather get to some offense. And I think playing like a Taylor Ward, 4,300. That's a pretty good price tag for him. It's down from the 5,000 plus that we've seen him in the early going this season. Trout 61 still sure. 63 for Otani. Yeah, of course. Uh, Anthony Rendon still at 4,000. You can play Renfro. Drury's just been the best hitter in baseball over the last week against Oakland pitching. Renjifo back in the lineup regularly as well. And Wallach has pop behind the plate. Zach Neto seeing the baseball a little bit from the bottom. So you can play some some Angels here. You can play some Brewers on the other side. Probably no pitching outside of maybe some deep tournament stuff with Tyler Anderson just as a price play, but really not super excited about that either. Okay, Aaron Nola on the mound against Houston. Yeah, blah. Not really excited about this. 9600 for him. I don't like the price tag. And uh, we got to keep an eye on whether Houston is going to get Jordan Alvarez back. He's been dealing with a neck issue. And um, we're not sure if he's actually going to be in there. So he is the, you know, he, I mean, he's Jordan Alvarez. He hits both lefties and righties. Um, excellent. But... Outside of that, they, they've only got one lefty, so that would play into Aaron Nola's hands a little bit in terms of raw whiff stuff. Um, we'll give up a little bit of contact to them still, the righties, but uh, strikes him out at a full 29% clip. It, it The control is excellent, and he stays off the barrel, induces a good bit of soft contact, 17% to both sides. It's a really good number over a huge sample for Nola, but this season in his first four starts, they have not been good. He's really not eking any value out of the two-seamer, which has been traditionally his his kind of go-to money pitch. He's not getting any swing and miss on it down in the strike zone, and he's elevating a little bit. And it's leading to a lot of contact. Hasn't had a good changeup for a couple of years now. It's always been the curveball and the two-seamer mix. He's got some good run on the four-seamer. Um Four-seamer typically going to be a little bit straighter than the two-seamer, of course. 
But if your two-seamer's running straight also, it's just at 92, and that makes it a very hittable pitch. And that's really what we've seen in the first five outings from Nola. Haven't been all that impressive. Hasn't cracked 17 DK, DK points just yet. And he's had some good matchups at Texas when they were really cold to start this season. At the Yankees, good matchup, strikeout matchup there. Miami, Cincy, and Colorado. And it, the K stuff hasn't quite showed up yet. Um Four Ks against Texas and three and two-thirds gave up five runs. Six innings against the Yankees struck out five but gave up three. Four earned, two earned, three earned in each of his last three starts against Miami, Cincy, and Colorado. So the strikeout stuff in the last two, in ver- or three really, in the last three outings, Colorado, Cincy, Miami, six, four, and three, not all that impressive. So he's struggling a bit to get it going as Nola and at 9,600 elevated price tag and kind of elevated ownership here at 10% against a very difficult lineup that looks to be getting it going. There's they've kind of solidified Mo Dubon at the top of the lineup with the absence of Jose Altuve, uh, Jeremy Pena getting it going a little bit. Alex Bregman starting to see the baseball. Kyle Tucker, of course, Josie Abreu has been awful. Um, so they finally dropped him down in the in the lineup, but hopefully we get Jordan back tonight, and I think he might actually be able to play some Houston against Aaron Nola. He is just not spotting the the two seamer and the and the strikeout stuff just isn't there. The reason I I would side with Houston would be the ownership number on Nola, given the elevated price tag. I I don't want to go after this at at a north of 10% here. I think there's some other guys in this range, notably like a Bieber or even an Eflin, that you could probably prefer to play rather than Nola when he's struggling. So I think we could probably play some very sneaky Houston pieces tonight and go after Aaron Nola. I, I, the Philly bullpen has actually been okay, um, despite the fact that their starting pitching hasn't really been excellent. But they're still attackable, and... They've got an 11.5% walk rate, one of the higher numbers on the day as a as a full unit back there. 323 Woba is you know from the Philly bullpen so far with a buck 46 whip. That's a pretty big number. Um, now, they're not giving up a whole lot of hard contact, the bullpen, so it would make them at the Astros over here a little bit difficult to full stack. And certainly this is Aaron Nola, we generally like, going after a traditionally really good arm. But if you want to get to some short Houston stacks, I think that's a viable play here with at, at some attainable price tags. Jeremy Pena, 43, as I mentioned. Bregman doesn't strike out. Not super crazy about the 4,400 price tag for him, but 44 is pretty good price for Bregman in general when we normally pay near 5,000 for him. And Mo Dubon at the top of the lineup, who I mentioned, 3,400, he didn't strike out at all. So uh, and, of course, if Jordan is back, go ahead and play him and throw Kyle Tucker in there, too, if you want. Down to 56 is Tucker. So uh, it's a playable stack, not not a favorite, but I think you can get to some NOLA showing some uh, vulnerability here so far this season. Framber on the mound for the Astros. 10K for him. Ugh. Um, it's, again, the, the price tag here and, and the ownership. I, I, I'm less enthused about the ownership than I am about the price tag. Uh, I'd rather just kind of find the extra money on a full... 11 gamer and get up to DeGrom I think um I really don't like attacking Philly even though I like playing for Amber I like playing him at lower ownership and this is a difficult lineup to go after man even though they've been striking out a little bit not creating so far just yet they're still pretty difficult to get through they are they're balanced they got Bryson Stott up at the top of the lineup they're giving him all the ABs man and they're just gonna let him go Turner, Schwarber, Castellanos has been excellent to start the season. JTR in the middle of the lineup. Alec Bohm has been good. Brandon Marsh, they'll probably drop him down to the bottom uh, against a lefty, but he's been excellent as well. Edmundo Sosa's got some pop. So they, they have a lot of balance here from both sides of the plate that can make it a little sticky on Framber. Now, we're not generally worried about that because he's got a 4-1 to one ground ball to fly ball ratio. We don't really care. Because he keeps the ball on the ground, any issues that may arise, he just gets so many ground balls, outs, and double play outs um, that he can run deep into a game and keep the pitch count down. But against Philly, even still, I'm not super crazy about going after a very high ownership number, 30%. It's it's fine since we're kind of lacking some uh, really elite spots today, but this isn't 
really an elite spot against Philly, to be quite honest. So uh, I'm not overly thrilled paying a full 10K on an 11 gamer when there's some offenses I think I'd, I'd like to play for Framber in kind of a difficult matchup. Um, elevated ownership really keeps me off here. And if this drops and we see some normalization after some potential cancelizations or, or cancellations, I'm not sure why I threw an extra syllable in there, um, then I think that becomes more attractive. But uh, at, at a full 30% now, I think I'd rather just get up to DeGrom or get down to like a Bieber or something like that um, in what I think is a better raw batted ball matchup. But Houston pieces for sure, again, in targeting Nola, I think he's susceptible a little bit. Um, Arizona and Colorado at Coors Field. Now you're going to see all the ownership of the world come to this game for sure, as you normally do. Merrill Kelly on the mound for the D-back, 7,300. Okay, like, this is a good price tag for Merrill, and I love playing this guy in tournaments at very low ownership, and you're certainly going to get that uh, today when he's at Coors Field. Um, I, it's not a favorite play here, but in the in this mid-range, kind of 7K or so, if we lose that Atlanta and Mets game and... Um, you know, you're going to see a lot of ownership. It's got to go somewhere. Well, it's not going to go here. I can tell you that much. So if it does pop up to like a Lucas Giolito at 7,500 or down to a an Alec Manoa at 69, Merrill Kelly's still going to be left out in the cold here. And he has upside to suppress the Rockies. This is a bad lineup, man. Uh, over here, even though this is at Coors Field and he does throw a curveball at a solid 15% of the arsenal, he still has a good enough fastball mix here with the four-seamer, two-seamer cutter throwing a, a full, what, an aggregate 65% of the time here for those three pitches, all plus value for him. And he also has the changeup he can go to and stay down in the strike zone and neutralize Colorado. At Coors Field, he's got some kind of mixed results. He's gotten picked apart a couple of times. Um, but overall, it's it's fine production for him at given that it's a, a pretty soft toss in righty at just 92 93 without raw k stuff sub 10 percent swinging strike rate right, at coors field um he also throws a curveball so given all of that like he's had some pretty decent outings against the rockies in general now most of them yeah of course they, they will come uh you know, most of the good outings that is though they will come in arizona but in his last start Against uh, the Rockies, for example, at Coors Field last season, last July, heart of the summer, still went seven innings. Didn't strike out a lot of guys, but suppressed. And he can go deep, and as long as he's suppressing contact, suppressing production, it makes him a very viable tournament piece. And this is an attractive price tag. He's down from, uh, let's see, where was he? He's down from 8,100 in his last start, and he should be. It is a Coors Field game, so um, this is kind of what should happen, but he's got 20 and, and 22 in the tank here against the Rockies. This has been a pretty poor lineup. Certainly, we're going to be able to attack them pretty much all season. This is a bad team, uh, even at Coors Field. Now, do I w want to go out of my way to target Merrick Kelly? Uh, no, but if you want to get five, seven teams or something uh, with some Kelly on them, I think it's a pretty shrewd tournament play. Um now, don't hold it against me when it goes wrong because this is Coors Field. But uh, yeah, I think this is okay. And he can he can run six innings here and strike out even a full K an inning uh, against the Rockies. This is a pretty poor team. That said, if you want to play some of the Rockies, Charlie Blackman, they've had him leading off 4,000. Jerry Profar starting to see the baseball a little bit better, 3,400 for him. Chris Bryant, of course, he avoided a, a major back injury. C.J. crone has been terrible. He's up to 49 um, sure, you can play him in stacks. Not my favorite one-off or anything. McMahon, 46. They're all playable here. Mike Moustakas actually seeing the baseball really well. Made some changes in the offseason. Uh, went to a toe tap in the, in, in the swing, and that's really allowed him to stay a lot more balanced through the baseball. He's at first and third eligible at 3,000 flat. So you can play some of these guys. They're going to get a little balanced uh, lefty-righty. And that makes them playable. So you can really play both sides here just because it's the Rockies at playable price tags at Coors Field. Uh, not necessarily a matchup. Like if this game were in Arizona, I'd, 
I'd be smashing Merrill Kelly here. Um, and I don't think a lot is all that different, to be quite honest. Uh, even though the game, of course, the ballpark and the altitude play a, a significant role. But uh, batted ball-wise, n- nothing changes, right? So 7,300, very attractive for Merrill Kelly. Kyle Freeland for, at 6,400, not attractive. Uh, we're not going near this. I, I just I rarely play Kyle, uh, except in, like, L.A. and it's 60 degrees in the middle of the summer, and he's 1% owned, and he's free. You know, like, he has some suppression upside. He'll go deep into a game on occasion, but the arsenal is not impressive. The whiff stuff just isn't there for him, and he's a he's one of the guys that you do probably just want to X out of the pool. Against Arizona, they've been very good against lefties, been very good against righties, too. Uh, 22% K rate so far, not walking enough. As soon as they get this number up, I mean... We mentioned it earlier. They run a lot. They got a guy. They got guys here with a lot of speed, um, and they're gonna they're gonna swipe some bases on you and make it really difficult on you. That'll make it really difficult on Kyle. So you can get to some base dealers here, even if you don't want to full stack Arizona uh, with with the ownership. You can get to some Cattell Marte has speed, of course. Um, Manny Rivera looks like they're going to, I believe, activate him. But he's at 2,600. If he's in the two-hole, this is a smash play. Um, it'll probably be 30 or 35 percent if that's the case. But um, really, really good play there if just price adjusted. I mean, and you can play some of the the, the speed guys. Yeah, you can play Corbin Carroll, of course. He's up to 5,300 now, but I don't really care. Um, Alec Thomas, you can play. He's got speed. And the Gabby Moreno, if he's uh, not Gabby Moreno, um, Jerry Perdomo is who I meant to say. Um, you can also play him. He's got some speed down at the bottom of the lineup. We'll see how they want to run it. They may platoon Gabby with a Nick Ahmed or something. They'd really prefer to have Nick Ahmed in the list for his defense. But all of the Arizona bats are cheap, and it's going to make them super popular once again, targeting Kyle Freeland. So you're going to have to figure out how to balance ownership again. And if you want to run like correlated. Diamondback stacks with Merrill Kelly. I think it's a pretty shrewd way to do it, to be quite honest. Uh, pretty low probability, I'd say, to get you there, but um, not out of the realm of possibility. So it's just ownership that we always have to balance um, at, at Coors Field. And I think today, is, well, it's really no different, but you can still make it happen. Okay, Cincinnati and Oakland. Luis Sessa on the mound for the Reds. 5K for him. I think it's a playable, playable spot here. Uh, I do not like the strikeout stuff, so... Just because Oakland is generally bad, um, I think that's that's playable, and because he's 5,000. But outside of that, like every fundamental number is going to tell you to stay away from it, and it'll tell you to stack Oakland. And okay, fine, let's do it. So I think you play both sides. I I side with Oakland, uh, but Luis Sessa at 5,000 is okay. He can run for five innings and strike out five or six or something. Um, 25% K rate against righties so far, mostly because of two outings against Degrom, I guess. Uh, 9% walk rate. They're they're moving at the top of the lineup a little bit with an Asturi Ruiz. Got some speed guys like a Connor Capel, um, Tony Kemp a little bit. Jace Peterson's got pop from the left side. And Luis Sessa gives up power, right? 197 ISO to the lefties, 212 ISO to the righties. So you can absolutely stack some Oakland pieces here. Probably not going to be played all that much. But it's, it's warmish in the Bay tonight at looking like 60 degrees, and I think that's fine to attack some Oakland uh, going after Luis Sessa. He's really not been good. The whiff stuff has never been there for him, so he's not going to throw it by Oakland. That's really how you want to attack them. But if that's not going to happen, you can play some stacks. So only a price play here for Luis Sessa if you mix him in. Probably just a late slate play, to be honest. And I'd rather get to a $4,000 Drew Rosinski on the other side if I'm going to play somebody down here in this range. Uh, Rosinski's coming over from the KBO this season. Um, he's been in throwing for the Dinos for the last f- uh, four years, I believe. And he's got really good numbers over there, throwing a four-seamer, a little bit of a two-seamer, and a cutter mix mostly. Huge ground ball rate and good swinging strike stuff. Now, we do have to take all of that with a grain of salt. The KBO is not the MLB. Uh, it's pretty widely regarded as the... Um, I would say the third best top tier professional league to obviously MLB and then the NPB over in Japan. 
Um, not a lot of strikeouts happen over there, so it's encouraging that he's exhibiting a, a 12 and 13% strikeout or swinging strike rate over there. But for the most part, pretty low upside, not a lot of power that comes from the lineups there. And in aggregate, it's a pretty low strikeout league. So that that is in, encouraging, but very attackable lineups over there. And even though he's exhibiting about a 23, 24% strikeout rate over in the KBO, that's going to drop a, at least two or three ticks when you come back over to Major League Baseball. Um However, this is the Reds, so this is a pretty good tune-up matchup for him. 26% K rate so far against righties. 10% walk rate, getting on base a little bit. They've got a couple of guys that will steal at the top of the lineup, in particular Johnny India and TJ Friedel. They've got some power there with Spencer Steer. He's got pop. Still a 3,000 for him. That's playable if you want to go after a guy making his first start in the big leagues here in the last four years. Really never had overwhelming stuff to begin with, but he moved... He moved over to a cutter, um, so he's got a really strong sort of fastball mix here. I didn't, don't have it in the sheet, so hard to illustrate, really. But um, added the cutter, and that's a, a really good pitch over into KBO because of the lack of power. Um, not so much over here in MLB, but still a, a very good pitch that neutralizes a lot of hard contact. He's got a huge ground ball rate. We're talking 4-1 to one over in the KBO. Um, can't really fake that number. So that's going to be very high still. So we'd want to get guys from the Reds over here if we are playing them. Uh, preferably, that can get it in the air a, a quite quite a bit here. And that would be a Jake Fraley type of guy. He's at 3,800. I think this is a damn good late slate play. Um, Tyler Stevenson at 42, pretty expensive. Not really enthused about that on the main slate. 47 for Johnny India, still a ground ball hitter himself. Um, TJ Friedel hits from the left side, 35. That's a playable price. You can go after a little bit of Drew Rusinski, but not my favorite. And honestly, I'd rather side with him at 4,000. If you need to get expensive on the mound and with a stack, Rusinski can he can run five and six innings here. He's been very durable over in the KBO, and it's that it's that really calm sort of uh, fastball mix that's keeping his career alive. Um, and frankly, like the the Dinos over there in the KBO, they they've been the best lineup really for the past several seasons. They hit for the most power, and are the most difficult to get through. So he's had some pretty favorable matchups to say the least. Um, but he's four thousand, and if you want to take some shots here, and it's likely going to be him. Now I don't think they've officially announced him just yet, or maybe they have. Uh, I did see some some lineup pages across the rest of the industry update in the last little while. So they do have him now, so perhaps Oakland um, has officially announced him. In any case, uh, it's pretty likely to be him. Not making his debut until now because he was on the deal with a hamstring. So not not like an arm-related problem or anything like that. So I think you can play some 4,000 Drew Rosinski here and go after some red. Pretty low upside lineup, just an 81 WRC plus so far. 112 ISO. Like, okay. Um, yeah, sure. I'll take shots on a very cheap arm down here against a pretty weak lineup in a hitter or a pitcher's ballpark. Okay, St. Louis and the Dodgers. I'm not, we'll just probably get through this pretty quickly. I'm not going near Jack Flaherty. Uh, I'm not touching him. He still has Huge problems to lefties. He's been very good against the right side so far. Uh, but I'm going to stack against this guy literally every single slate until he proves to me that the hard contact numbers to the left side of the plate have been totally solved. And he hasn't yet. They're still there. Um, and they're not they're not coming down. So uh, 223 ISO, 269 average with a 376 Woba to the left side. Yeah, give me the lefties again for a raw power matchup. 30%, 31% hard contact rate, 1.6 homers per nine. Let's go. To the right side, he's got a huge walk rate still. 18%, we talked about this in his last start. That hasn't changed either. So the control is still a major problem for Flaherty, and I'm not doing that. Even though the Dodgers pitching staff has been terrible, their offense is still putting up runs. I know they got shut out like twice against the uh, against the Pirates uh, over the weekend, but um, or over this week. 
Yeah, I don't really care. This is still the Dodgers. Probably going to get Max Muncy back tonight. Like that, he is at 5,000 flat. James Outman, we're going to play him again, 4,100. Freddie, 5,100. Very playable there. And, of course, 54 for Mookie. So if we don't see any ownership coming into the Dodgers tonight, then I think he's a very good stack. You can play him on the main slate. You can play him on the late slate. Play him everywhere. Uh, I'm going to attack Jack Flaherty, and I've been banging my head against the wall for his first few starts of the year, and he's just making me look like an idiot. But um, that's results. And I don't really care. The numbers still tell me to attack these uh, these weaknesses here. 56, 57% strike one rate, 15% aggregate walk rate, no whiff stuff, and and hard contact to both sides of the plate. High power numbers to lefties. So I'm going to attack it. And um, you know, I hope nobody watches this so I can get the lower ownership of the Dodgers. So it, if and when it works, uh, I'll look like a genius. But... Um, no flarity for me whatsoever. Only the Dodgers. Dustin May on the other side, 7,900. Really not wild about this price tag in this matchup. 21% aggregate K rate for the Cardinals so far this year. Uh, 152 ISO. This is starting to creep up a little bit. And 108 WRC plus. Starting to create now with uh, Wilson Contreras in the middle of the lineup. Hitting for a, a little bit more average and warming up a little. Of course, you've got Goldschmidt. Gorman, Arenado in the 2-3-4 holes. Lars at the top at 43. Alec Burleson's going to make it difficult um, as a raw strikeout matchup for Dustin May. And he's got a sub-20% K rate himself. Now, really good stuff plus metrics on Dustin May for the four-seamer and the two-seamer. Uh, these are really the, the money-making pitches for him. Neutral value on the cutter. Good slider, though. Um, so with a, a really workable fastball mix here and a very good breaking pitch it, it makes him serviceable now he struggled kind of out the gate here a little bit um in his last couple outings looking it up here over on the other monitor um he got uh, his last outing was actually very strong got the cubs five and a third struck out six just gave up two before that he had the mets in san francisco where he got picked apart a little bit uh but overall this is in a an attractive arm and he has upside 79 i'm not super wild about this price but he is down from the 8 92 84 8300 that he has been in his previous start so um if you want to mix in some dustin may at very low ownership i don't think this is horrible it's a bad bad ball matchup and a bad strikeout matchup for him in general for a pretty low strikeout arm himself so um it's okay if you land on it i wouldn't exit but i'm not super thrilled about it um and playing the Cardinals, I don't really want to do that either. Pretty expensive price tags over here, given the, the really good arsenal over here for Dustin May. This kid throws hard, man. 97-98 uh, down in the strike zone is very difficult to get to. So not wild about getting to most of the Cardinals over here. Just give me the Dodgers almost exclusively. Okay, uh, long today, uh, about an hour again. Hopefully that provides some value and a little bit of direction for us tonight. Um Keep an eye on this Washington game. Probably going to get canceled. Same thing with the land and the Mets. Give me, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Give me some Manoa, I guess. But give me some Castillo on the mound for Seattle if the ownership stays low. I hate the price tag over here, though. I don't, I don't really know how to side um, with guys in this game. Maybe give me some Seattle. Sure, I think that's okay with Kelnick in the three hole. I think that makes him a much more playable lineup against right-handed pitching. Tampa and the White Sox. Give me some Tampa and some Eflin. I'm not. I like Giolito's, Giolito's price tag a little bit better. I do not want to go after Tampa. I uh, did it with Hunter Brown, but um, we're not going to do that with Giolito. He's got some some pretty more uh, some more serious weaknesses. Let me put it that way. Um, really against both sides of the plate, and Tampa is just elite. Uh, so give me the Rays. No White Sox. Cleveland and Boston. Give me some Guardians here and some Shane Bieber on the mound. I don't want any Pavetta. Don't really want any Boston either. Um, no Yankees tonight, of course, against DeGrom. And give me some Texas lefties against Clark Schmidt. Big uh, suppression issues there for him. Big ISO numbers. Angels, Milwaukee. I like the Brewers here a little bit for some regression. I also kind of like Tyler Anderson a little bit for some regression. So you can play both sides there. No Wade Miley. And, yeah, if you want to play some of the Angels, got a couple playable pieces down there for sure. Philly and Houston, probably some Houston pieces, I think. Very sneaky here against Aaron Nola. I don't really want to deal with the Nola stuff uh, against, especially if Houston gets uh, Jordan Alvarez back tonight. Framber 
Also not super wild, about 10K for him on the mound against Philly, uh, but don't want to stack against him, so eh, just kind of a gross game. Arizona and Colorado, just got to balance ownership here, and I might, might be able to do it with some Merrill Kelly pieces. Uh, don't tell anybody I said that, though. Since he in Oakland, give me Drew Rosinski on the mound. And some Oakland bats against Luis Sessa. He's not been good. Doesn't have any K stuff himself. So uh, you can play, if you need to get to some expensive guys, um, expensive primary stack perhaps to get to a DeGrom, then use a, a Drew Rusinski and some A's. That's uh, very playable. St. Louis and the Dodgers, just the Dodgers here. I'm stacking against Flaherty pretty much every start until he tells me uh, that I shouldn't be with any of the, the contact numbers. So that's it, guys. Um, sorry it's so long once again, but big, big 11-game slate tonight. Hopefully it gets dropped down to nine. I think that's kind of the sweet spot, but some still uh, some attackable spots for us uh, on the mound. Keep an eye out for the ownership and projection updates. Going to have to make some decisions here today, but always large slates uh, are a good opportunity to get different and, and piece things together in tournaments. So, uh, hope that helped, guys. Uh, good luck if you're playing tonight.